Welcome all and, and thank you for attending this webinar about wildfires in the Democratic Republic of Congo. Uh, my name is Guillaume Canaletta. I am an environmentalist and part of the executive team of Pau Costa Foundation. And uh, some of you might not know what Pau Costa Foundation is. Um, basically, the Pau Costa Foundation is a non-profit organization based in Barcelona, Spain, that facilitates the encounter between researchers, emergency bodies and civil society. We focus on the prevention and management of forest fires and other major emergencies uh, with the aim of disseminating knowledge and, and making tangible projects that serve both the, the forest fire community and, and society. So in that sense, uh, one of the actions that we started last year is that every month we organize a, a webinar to, to analyze the current situation of wildfires at global scale. For example, we started in March 2020 talking about Argentina wildfires and today we will already present our ninth webinar that will deal with uh, wildfires in the Democratic Republic of Congo. So in particular, in this ninth webinar, fire management in, in Congo. And for this purpose, we will have uh, an expert, Lyndon Pronto, who has more than 15 years of experience and expertise in, in landscape fire management including in, in Congo and among other international organizations. So thank you, Lyndon, for having accepted to participate and share experience and, and knowledge in relation with this interesting topic. Uh, specifically, Lyndon uh, will present an overview of the wildfire profile of the Congo before diving into uh, his fieldwork and experience in Kivu province and discussing the local wildfire challenges and what has been done to, to address them in the, in the area. And finally, he will zoom out again and discuss some of the broader efforts, including uh, his work for the US Forest Service. Uh, Lyndon holds a master's degree in environmental governance, and he has over 15 years of experience in the field of landscape fires. He has worked and conducted research in over 10 countries, Nevertheless, he will explain in a couple of minutes much better than me his uh, professional career and about facing the wildfire challenges that Congo is currently having. And before I give you the floor, Lyndon, the webinar will last one hour. Uh, Lyndon will speak about uh, 45 minutes approximately, and then there will be a 15 minute room for questions and answers. So please feel free to make your questions in the yellow button, which is in the center of your screen during the session. Uh, and after the presentation, I will be in charge of reading your questions or comments uh, to our speaker. Also, please uh, bear in mind that in case we run out of time to answer all the questions, uh, do not worry. We will address these questions to uh, Lyndon and, and he will be happy to, to reply to all of them. And if that's the case, uh, the answers will be published on, on our website. So, Lindo, thank you again for participating and, and the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you very much for the introduction. Um, yeah, so I'm happy to be here. Thank you for joining. Um, yeah, as mentioned, I've, I've been involved in wildland fire stuff for, for quite a number of years now. Um, and I started out, uh, I'm originally from California, so I started out in the uh, wildland firefighter scene there in Northern California, where I gathered about uh, seven years of practical experience. Um, so in the meantime, I've, I've mostly been um, uh, less on the practical side and more on the um, uh, capacity development and project work across Europe and Southeast Asia, um, also several projects in Indonesia and a couple of projects in the Congo. So uh, today I will take us down into the Congo. Um, let me share my screen here. Alrighty, does everybody see that? Okay. Um, yeah, so first, um, I will start out um, with a very short overview. Um, and then 
I'll actually talk about the two different uh, projects um, efforts that, that I'm aware of. Um, one on the west side of the Congo and one on the east side of the Congo. Um, and then I'll just kind of go down into the, the communal level view. Um, so as many of you know, Africa is, is considered the, the fire continent, um, basically because you have significant fire activity that is year round across the continent. So it spreads up, down, back up again. And so um, on the satellite imagery, you can, you can of course see fire activity in bands uh, across the African continent. Um, the DRC, which is uh, in the middle of the continent, is a very active region for fire. Um, and uh, a lot of the DRC is tropics, um, the rainforest, in fact. Um, but it's also uh, parts of the Congo are also lightning hotspots. So it's, I think, lightning capital of the world. So we have a very ancient and long history of, of fire activity um, across this landscape, um, the savanna landscape. Uh, and um, yeah, so uh, because of how ecologically diverse the Congo is, um, Obviously, a fire activity across this region is, is very significant, um, also in terms of global carbon cycling, um, which you may remember uh, 2019, uh, most recently, there was a very, and even last year, there was a huge focus all of a sudden on the DRC um, in conjunction with the Amazonian fires. Uh, so there was, there was a lot of media frenzy about the fires burning in Amazonia. And at some point, somebody pointed out, well, if you look at the satellite imagery, actually, Angola and DRC are, are um, burning much more. Um, but uh, one of the important distinctions there is that uh, many of the fires that were burning across the DRC were burning in um, fire-dependent ecosystems, whereas uh, in the Amazon, we were talking more about um, ecologically sensitive rainforest, the Pantanal region, um, so areas that aren't actually supposed to burn. That said, um, the Congo is also, uh, which is increasing, um, increasingly impacted by land use change. And with that comes um, people using fire in the landscape and also as a deforestation tool. So if we look at fire management in the West, I mean, we're talking about um, really structured fire management approaches, first beginning with fire suppression. We're, we're talking about just over 100 years, 120 years or so. Um, and the real understanding of fire ecology um, and the benefits of fire is, is more so in the last uh, 40 years. Um, so if we were to consider how far we've come really focusing on fire management issues in the West, and if you look in these, in these decades uh, down in the DRC, we're, we're talking about um, uh, a situation that, that was really unstable. Um, we had major exploitation of Europeans across the African continent, and DRC was, of course, not spared from that. Um, so they only became gained their independence from Belgium in 1960. Um, so over the next uh, 30 years, uh, there was about 20 years that was a sort of stable dictatorship, uh, but that began to deteriorate. So by the early 90s and uh, 1994 um, is the infamous uh, Rwandan genocide. Um, and then that kicked off the Congo Wars, which have been ongoing. Um, so in one of the regions where I worked in, in South Kivu, I, this is still a, an active conflict zone. Um, so you can imagine organized fire management uh, is, is uh, a bit of a, uh, yeah, <laughs> it's not something that really happens. So um, aside from these uh, old practices of, of using fire in the landscape, there's really no organized approach to fire management uh, in the Congo. Uh, so really, the the exposure uh, of um, you know, the efforts of fire management uh, uh, has been through basically through projects. Um, there are there have been some legal frameworks that that have been established in relation to fire. I'll get into that in a minute. But really, we're talking about development projects uh, based on forestry capacity building uh, and and a couple of fire management projects that I'm going to go into. Um, and many of these are also looking at um, not just fire management, it was fire management that kind of uh, came into focus actually um, because the focus of projects were on forestry and, and uh, land use management um, and inventorying forest and then all of a sudden um, 
the people that were coming in from the outside started to realize, well, we can't really address uh, building capacity in forestry or, um, you know, uh, achieving any sustainable development goals, for instance, um, without looking at the is issue of fire, which is um, so widespread, even, even in the areas where um, there should not be fire. So one of these, um, one of these efforts has been headed up by the um, U.S. Forest Service International Programs uh, in conjunction with USAID. And they have been working um, on fire management issues um, since 2009 um, and more intensively since 2015. And they were uh, mostly working in the, uh, in the both, both the Congo, so the Republic of the Congo and the DRC. Um, and they were more focused on these land, land management plans um, until they zeroed in on the fire management aspect. Um, and since the US Forest Service is obviously um, known across the world as having this um, great capacity in fire management, um, they quickly dove into that facet as well. Um, they worked in several regions. I, I put a lot of text here just because I know this is gonna be posted. Um, but I'm not going to read it. So, um, but basically, they've been working um, in the Mainomome province, uh, which is about, which is kind of north, um, northeast of of the capital Kinshasa. Um, and in this region, one of the major concerns is the bonobo, the the um, great um, apes. Uh, their habitat has has been very threatened. So this is one of the the things that they've been working on also in terms of uh, landscape um, and land use planning and, and that sort of thing. So they, um, they in 2015, they eventually started to zero in on, on training trainers and training firefighters and establishing some fire brigades um, at local level and, and teaching about fire prevention, um, which has been um, you know, expanded to eight different territories there. Um, Another another component that they worked on um, in that um, well, this is at national level was was a review of legislation that pertains to fire in one way or another. Um, so there, in the end, there there are about eight different laws that that govern fire use, um, and there's a, there's actually an, an administrative structure that's set forth for the the creation of fire brigades. Um, these two through provincial level authorities and one at, at sector or chiefdom level, but there's really no guidelines or guidance as to how to implement this. And also, obviously, there's really no money to implement that. So despite the fact that, that there is some um, fire management uh, guidelines, uh, structural guidelines embedded in the legal system, there's really um, the only... Uh, progress or, or efforts that have been made has been through um, foreign development um, that, that I'm aware of. Um, of course, once these uh, once these projects were established, then there was a multiplication factor so that they have uh, gained a little bit of, of, of a foothold and, and propagated on their own. Um, this is um, where I, I came in uh, most recently um, and I was I was contracted by the U.S. Forest Service International Programs to help prepare or finish up this uh, fire management package um, that was to be delivered to the DRC and, and um, also applied to the broader Central Africa region, uh, where they're also working in other countries. Um, so this is kind of just a, some visual examples of, of some of the stuff that I worked on. Um, there were there were obviously a, a lot of people that came before me and and helped uh, develop these materials initially and then I kind of picked up where they left off to finalize this this package. Uh, unfortunately because of COVID I wasn't able to actually go down uh, and do the field missions that I was supposed to do uh, to work with the different communities to implement uh, for instance the fire management uh, plans at, at uh, terroir level um, but there have been a number of trainings that have been going on. Um, the other project I was involved in uh, was a German uh, NGO, which uh, focuses uh, exclusively on Africa. And they've been working in the Congo for about 25 uh, plus years uh, in the Eastern side of the Congo. 
um, and they have a completely different landscape, a completely different uh, set of issues there. Um, and I was actually involved in this uh, 2007, 2018. So I was, um, I did this before um, working with the US Forest Service, but it actually worked out quite well because I got, um, you know, good field experience and, and a good understanding um, of the whole socio-cultural backdrop uh, to be able to, um, yeah, be, be productive and, and useful. Um, so, I guess I'm going to dive now into some of my field work, uh, just to kind of paint a, a better picture. Um, as mentioned, there's um, there's really not a whole lot in terms of fire management uh, efforts or firefighting or um, anything like that. So, um, diving into this uh, very local level. Even so, is is uh, to my knowledge, and I and I tried to do as much research as I could in in preparing my reports for the field missions and that sort of thing, um, and for the donor was was trying to canvas what sort of efforts had already taken place through development aid or not, um, and there really wasn't anything. So as far as I know, this was kind of one of the first efforts to to do this on the east side where I was involved uh, in the field, and on the west side where um, where the others were involved. Uh, from the U.S. Forest Service. So the the main impetus for these um, the involvement of the NGO was to raise capacity for sustainable forest management and, and restore landscape. So on the left, you see um, you see a couple of pictures of actual uh, rainforest um, that was how this um, this landscape essentially is supposed to look. Um, and on the right, you see an image of what it what it looks like today in most of the area, which is completely denuded. Um, and these areas uh, have been extremely impacted by um, the conflicts of, of the Kivu Wars. And uh, conflict in um, conflict is one of the the worst, um, supposedly the worst on on ecology because. Uh, for instance, uh, in this area, the troop movements and um, feeding all these soldiers uh, essentially meant that uh, everything that was alive was was basically killed uh, for consumption. Um, not to mention the locals um, that that really relied on uh, what was available. So these areas are completely deforested now. The only reason this uh, on the left here is an actual natural forested area is because uh, a pharmaceutical company which manufactures malaria has this as a private reserve uh, and the tree, the bark from, from the tree that is for the malaria medication is, is grown on this reserve. Everything else, as far as the eye can see, is completely, um, the only vegetation you see has been artificially revegetated. The NGO was, was essentially working to um, try and reforest uh, the area to create a, a lively a source of income for the for the people there and then to also deal with the um, the soil uh, because the soil had through the erosion had become so poor that you could only grow in the river basins um, and the drainages which of course these crops get completely washed away then uh, in the two rainy seasons that they have uh, so they one of the fundamental ideas was to reforest um, to basically um, create a, a more livable environment. Um, this, uh, this landscape is, is really shocking uh, to be there um, because there, is, there isn't a single sound really. You might hear a bird now and then or a cricket, but aside from that, um, in, in nearly three weeks of being out in the field, um, I didn't see, I saw one hawk and I saw one snake and the hawk had just killed the snake. Um, aside from that, I, I didn't experience or see any other wildlife whatsoever, not a single um, house cat or domestic dog or anything like that. So it, really everything, um, the region has been so impacted um, through these conflicts uh, and yeah, there's really nothing, um, nothing there, which is why even, uh, uh, 
project like reforesting is so difficult because the moment you plant a tree, someone will try and cut it down to use it for fuel wood because there's no um, electricity. Um, so a little bit of a regional um, backdrop, uh, the political social backdrop, just because it is so important uh, when you try uh, and, and develops any sort of capacity um, to understand what, what you're really walking into. Um, yeah, as I mentioned, we, we have in this uh, South Kiva region, we have these wars uh, that um, that kind of came on the heels of the uh, Congo War. Uh, so the, the African uh, Civil War, uh, as it's kind of called, or African World War, as it's often referred to, kind of officially ended in 2003. Um, but since then, we've had um, a number of conflicts in the in the area in, in the eastern Congo, um, which have been some of the most gruesome uh, conflicts of anywhere in the world. Um, and often these conflicts are fueled by the amount of uh, resources that the Congo has. So the Congo is is hugely rich in in resources, especially ones that we also rely on in the West um, for our smartphones. All these all these uh, rare metals um, and walking around even in the landscape on the on the mountains you, you can walk around and you can pick up rare metals um it, it just is there it's it's absolutely it was mind-blowing for me how much raw materials that are that are precious are there but there's no way to connect them to a market um because it's it's um it's impossible with how um how the yeah, I mean, there's there's really no political system um, that can control the the guerrilla groups, the um, the militias, uh, the the companies that are in there. There's uh, roads, for instance, that the only reason the roads are there is because a mining company pays for the road to be there, and they pay for it to be uh, reconstructed twice a year after the rains wash it out. <laughs> so. Um, it's it's uh, quite quite interesting. Um, so the Human Development Index um, is is 176 out of 187. Um, so it's it's one of the lowest. Um, with um, we have you know extreme rampant poverty, uh, malnutrition, um, sexual violence, um, and and torture has been has been widespread with really um, startling numbers. Um, child soldiers. It's it's um, really uh, quite a depressing <laughs> um, overview of if you look at all these all these facts and figures, um, but it is a it is a reality, um, and it has uh, shaped the people in a way where they are, um, despite all of this uh, horrendous conflict and exploitation from foreign companies or foreign governments over the last hundred years. Um, it really is remarkable how um, resilient the people are um, to all of this and how, um, I, you know, I was shocked at how easy it was to work with all these uh, different communities um, and to have that level of motivation um, and ingenuity, despite uh, the lack of of, uh, of um, access to markets or resources. So when we went down there and we outfitted fire brigades, um, we had we were able to source. I mean, it took a lot of months of preparation, but we were able to basically source nearly all of you know everything from the uniforms from local markets, or we we had farmers um, go out and find. Um, you know, donate for the tool handles or to have uh, someone who could make tools, um, uh, the tool heads. And so it, it was uh, someone, a shoemaker. So, I mean, it was just like, we, we, we were able to connect all the things to be able to put together a, a coherent uh, like uniform, <laughs> uh, which, was, which was kind of cool. Um, so, yeah, I mean, the regional ecology, like I mentioned, is, has been quite, um, quite devastated uh, I'm not going to go read through all this, but um, basically, the Cozy Biega National Park is is the closest proxy for what the uh, original flora and fauna was before all of the conflicts. So, um, these several national parks 
in the Kaya, the Kaya has five national parks and, and two of them are in this area. Um, so they, they have been relatively well preserved. Um, so it's quite, quite a stark contrast to see um, by contrast how the afforestation sites and how the areas were where I was working was um, was completely denuded of any sort of um, natural flora or fauna that was that was there uh, 40, 50 years ago. Um, and so, yeah, so the idea was uh, was to reforest and these projects have been gone on, these reforestation projects have been going on for about uh, 20 years with uh, quite a high level of success um, until this uh, fire issue uh, kind of perked up. And so um, I guess the, I'll go through some of the kind of uses of fire in the region um, because it will paint a little bit of a picture of, of what some of the challenges are and, and how fire interacts with the landscape and the people. So um, the main fire use is, is pastoral burning, which, um, you know, is quite, is quite normal and common. Um, the challenge here is that, um, as you can see from the terrain, uh, if you were to light a fire, it, it quickly consumes a huge area of terrain. Um, and obviously there's, there's not many natural barriers that, that stop it. Um, the other thing is, which you can't see from the picture, but uh, because of the terrain and, and the climate, it's also extremely windy. Um, and so fire can spread quite quickly. Um, the primary users of fire are, um, are these cattle herders, which uh, are mostly children. Uh, there's a picture here in the lower corner here. We're talking like children under the age of 12 for the most part uh, that are in charge of, of keeping the cows. And um, for some reason, the cows uh, have grown quite attached to green grass only. Um, so they don't like eating the dry grass. And so the result is that they continually burn um, at, at, you know, very um, uh, high frequencies. And so you will have a landscape that has um, been burned many, many times in the same spot. Um, okay, so yeah, you can see here, for instance, um, you might have a, an area that's been burned, uh, I think, playing around with a resolution and, and some color stuff on, on Google imagery, I could discern that some areas uh, were burned um, seven up to six, seven times um, in a six month period because we have, two, we have these two seasons, um, meaning that um, you, you wouldn't see a, a black burn scar like that after a rainy season when the grass is regenerated. So this, you know, this told me that these areas were so frequently burned um, that it, it really no wonder that there's so much erosion and, and ecosystem damage. Um, another use is uh, the agricultural burning. You can see here it's it's quite uh, contained. Um, however, um, you know that there is no uh, making a fire line around it or, or containing it in any way. So oftentimes these fires creep creep away from from the pastures and into villages and and can impact structures and other crops or um, forest plantations. Um, of course, there's a there's a docket of other uh, sources of fire. Um, one of the main ones um, uh, it was the beekeeping because um, smoking out the bees. What they would do is they'd start a fire around um, at the base of the the beehive, and the smoke would smoke the bees out. And so you can see here these are two different approaches. One from one community where they made a fire break and then propped the beehive up on uh, stilts in the middle of the fire break. And when they wanted to harvest the honey, they would take, they would throw a blanket over it at night and take it down to the village and they would collect them all and smoke them all out in one location. Um, and then from a neighboring community, you see under this pile of very flammable pine needles, you see uh, another beehive um, and they went about things differently. So um, even here, you could see the ability the potential for one community to, to learn uh, just these simple uh, things that they've figured out on their own. Um, there's a huge potential there to share knowledge um, and really prevent some, some of these devastating fires um, that have ripped through uh, plantations and communities and, and crops. Um, 
conflict it was actually surprisingly um, little. There was there was only one community that reported a high incidence of of, of fire use or arson from conflicts. Um, however, in actual armed clashes, it's obviously a, a, a weapon weaponized to burn down villages. Um, so one of the major impacts was this erosion. Um, here you can see in the in the photos a road that has been um, you know washed away. Um, here a whole mountainside that's that's broken off. Um, and yeah, this was uh, just around every corner there were these huge uh, areas that were um, where erosion was a major issue. And you could see that fires had been used all around or even burning on the areas that were eroded. Um, yeah. Obviously we have also the ben the positive uh, aspects of fire, um, which I'm sure all of you are aware of, but to acknowledge that, that it is a huge, um, that it plays a huge role in this ecosystem. Um, what was unclear for me uh, was to what extent, even though this was a, a lightning capital uh, or you know a, a huge area of lightning incidents, what was unclear to me because I couldn't find anything in, in historical documents or anything like that was how um, how new these natural fires are to this particular landscape. Because as mentioned, this this used to all be rainforest, um, and and now it's no longer. So um, that was one thing that that I am still curious about. Um, I dug down or in banks, I looked, I could find charcoal. So obviously there's been, um, there's been landscape fires for, for many years. Um, so yeah, uh, here you can see some of the areas of, of this fire hazard in kind of three different, uh, three different areas. One is in, the, in a native landscape, which you can see here on the bottom right. Um, I'm standing in there somewhere. <laughs> Um, so you can see these very, very tall grasses uh, and bushes. So you can imagine if, if a fire gets established in here, uh, we're talking, you know, major flame lengths uh, and without any water or training or PPE or anything like that. Uh, obviously, there's nothing you can do to stop a fire uh, burning. You know, if a fire like burning in that landscape were to come up to the edge, you know, come up to a village which doesn't have clearance around it. Um, you're, you're talking a pretty catastrophic loss. Um, on the bottom left, there's a photo of, a, of two plantations that are right up next to each other. Uh, so this is kind of this um, cultural landscape where these non-native species have been brought in, um, in this case, pine and, and cypress and eucalyptus here have been brought in and planted in an area because the environmental conditions are so poor that nothing, none of the native species grow here anymore. And so that they've, they've imported these species, which are doing quite fine. Uh, however, they're also creating a huge fire risk. Uh, and this is the issue that the, they're just now coming to terms with because um, the native species weren't as, as uh, they weren't a fire, <laughs> fire dependent ecosystem essentially. Um, in this area. And then obviously up here we have the, the built environment um, where we have a grass that's thatched roofs right up against um, the wildland uh, or the vegetated areas. So if anything happened there, it would be a very quick jump to a roof. Um, as mentioned, you know, the, the vulnerability of the population is extremely high. Um, the, which was, um, Obviously, a major challenge when when considering how to train and and set up fire brigades, um, because it's very different from from how you know I'm used to thinking. You know, having having safe clothing and having water and and um, appropriate shoes and this sort of thing. Um, that's not that's not a given. There, there's there is no water. So there there were stories about. Um, you know, some the people who had voluntarily tried to fight fires, um, not having any shoes or anything like that. So they often suffered um, burns to their feet and hands. Um, and then they often uh, tipped over from from dehydration and exhaustion because they, they didn't have any water, uh, drinking water, that is not water for fighting a fire. Um, so this, these are some of these really, really limiting factors uh, when you think about the actual functioning of a fire brigade and and how to, you know, 
when you go put out a fire, you, you know, you make sure you have your, all your protective equipment and uh, ideally you use some water, um, but mainly also self care and to be able to work long hours or to be able to, you know, uh, fight a fire at night, you know, without a headlamp or um, yeah, basically have food and water. Um, you know, food was also not a given in this community. It was um, common for people to not, to, to only eat every few days. Um, yeah. So there, there's a really, uh, this population is very, very vulnerable. Um, as mentioned with bringing in these exotic species, it's, it's created a whole host of, of new problems. Um, on the one hand, it, it's helped um, create a source of livelihood for, to be able to sell the wood. Um, but now there's also major conflicts between different um, groups in the communities because, uh, you know, imagine being a forester or, you know, someone who's planting trees and then um, nurturing, nurturing these trees for uh, however many years to be able to, to harvest them and take them to market and, and support your family like that. Um, and then, uh, you know, a, a four-year-old uh, is burning, burning the, the grass nearby for, for the cows and in a matter of minutes, your, your whole plantation's gone. Um, you can imagine that that's uh, pretty devastating. <clears throat> um, so I guess one of the main takeaways uh, or dilemmas in, in this area was of course meeting this really uh, immediate need of uh, having a, a source of income, a livelihood um, and looking at the landscape, um, managing a landscape in a way that was sustainable. An ideal was to bring back native species, um, to reforest and to, you know, raise the topsoil again, to be able to not only be forced to grow in riverbeds, but, but to have mid-slope um, fertile soils to be able to, to also grow there. Um, and so we have on the one hand, we have basically supported from the from these projects from the outside this this anthropogenic landscape engineering, where you you've decided, okay, these species grow good here; they're fast, they're marketable, um, and they grow in all the places where the native species don't um, because of the harsh conditions. Um, but then, uh, how is that? You know, that's not necessarily uh, creating a a sustainable landscape and it's also creating uh, a fire hazard in, in areas uh, where there wasn't a fire hazard before. Um, so this notion of, of long-term sustainability or this longer view of, of having a resilient landscape is, is obviously um, thrown out the window if you have uh, basic survival needs, um, these, uh, these immediate needs right away. Um, and so <laughs> one of the interesting things was like some of these plantations, as I said, they've been growing for 20 years now. And then they realized there's no chainsaws here. So, or, or roads on these, on these really steep areas. So they realized that there was time to harvest the trees, um, but they had no way of getting them off the mountain. Um, and uh, cutting them down was also a, a new venture. Um, but you can see here, I mean, it's amazing um, what a crosscut saw can do. And they cut, the, you know, they would cut a tree in boards already, but leave it attached at one end so they could carry it down the mountain. Um, you know, really cool, cool little ways of, of, of optimizing considering the conditions. But it certainly was a challenge then of uh, how to even market the timber, how to get it to market um, when there's no way to get it off the mountain. Um, so yeah, I mean, I guess this is more of a, you know, a group of forestry uh, questions and challenges, um, how to utilize this landscape. Um, um, and of course, yeah, my, my assignment was to, was to figure out how to make these uh, plantations uh, safe from fire. Um, let's see. Okay. Um, yeah, so the, coming back to fire management, um, obviously, one of the you know primary things was you, you needed to have some sort of capacity building um, to train about good and bad fire. Um, 
that that fire is good but it's it's also um you know when to use it or when to when to not use it or to come up with alternative methods um you know one theme was like okay well can we train the cattle to eat dry grass um so that you could uh, harvest some of this this grass and uh in the months um when there wasn't uh, green grass or when you didn't want to light the landscape on fire to generate new green grass that the cows would then be confined to a space and and they would uh, use the eat the hay or the grass um, so these and these were kind of discussions that happened like okay well we've never done that or we don't want to do that or um, the cows don't eat that kind of grass um, <laughs> um, so it's also also changing these uh, you know, developing a new culture around um, practices that have been ongoing. Um, and the capacity building isn't just something that needs to come from the outside. As mentioned, like with the example with the beehives, I mean, they've, uh, through trial and error, they've already um, established in many areas really great solutions, um, you know, low cost or no cost uh, solutions other than other than time and effort, uh, which is is not to be underestimated because the um, obviously, um, the time commitment, you know, your time to is spent in a field or out collecting fuel wood. Um, there's, there's not really uh, a lot of leisure time in, in, in this context. Um, and then, yeah, in terms of changing culture to also suggest these, um, these management interventions that, you know, by religious leaders to teach, um, you know, like if, if we impart the view that, um, you know, nature is, uh, is equivalent to, to God or is sacred or um, to, to go about it from, from this angle, as I'm sure many of you have also worked in your context to, to work within this, this uh, system of belief. Um, and to try and be, you know, try and change the perspective. And by changing the perspective, you're able to, to change the behavior um, so that less destructive environmental environmental practices are, are then practiced. Um, yeah, and then obviously um, there's this part, which is, you know, where we kind of uh, came in from the outside with a little bit of, with a little bit of help and money. Um, but it is also an important part of the puzzle is that's just the basic tools and protective clothing, training, enforcement. Um, there's very little enforcement out here and, and what enforcement that does take place uh, in terms of laws in general are, are um, police and military um, that are, that are, yeah, they're <laughs> um, in many cases uh, operate in a very corrupt um unpredictable way um you know like in the training that i'd put on it was like we were uh, bribed for security that we didn't ask for so it was we're here for your protection and we wouldn't want something bad to happen to you and this is what it's going to cost you um <laughs> so and this is this is a, a system within which you need to work um so in, in terms of enforcing laws uh, around fire use um that is a challenge but it's also something that uh communities are also looking to their leaders for um in particular in managing these conflicts uh between like herders and people growing uh, forest and um yeah so in the end it was it was um valuable to show that you know many of these um solutions could be worked out in the community um that people could like using the tire flaps to make a fire swatter um, or in this picture, you know, just the, the bushes um, as many people <laughs> use in, in around the African continent is, is quite effective. Um, I was, I was quite surprised myself uh, how effective a brand was. Um, so these, this capacity building and this uh, training is, is important and needed, but it's also uh, difficult uh, if it's not stimulated from the outside. Um, in this in this case, uh, securing the plantation sites, there was a lot of um, scarcity for fuel wood uh, to, to be able to cook uh, and, and warm. Um, but there was also um, areas where these plantations were either um, exploited to the point where it would degrade from the tree's ability to grow, 
in a couple pictures, you'll see how, um, how the trees are limbed all the way up to the very top. Um, I don't know how they get up there, but they managed to cut all the limbs off and use those. Um, and then there's other areas where the limbs are um, left to be. And so there's, it creates a fire hazard because then it's easy, easy ladder fuel um, and the whole plantation could easily go up. Um, and then there are other areas where the limbs were cut off and just left there when they could have been used for, for fuel wood. Uh, so there was a lot of, uh, a lot of fairly, simple solutions to to protect the plantations that also benefited the locals around that where they could actually use the fuel wood or to thin certain areas of the plantation so it wasn't so thick and and couldn't carry fire so easily um uh yeah so i mean basically some of the takeaways um are that it, the conditions are extremely harsh um and the parameters within the, to work and, and to affect some sort of change are really reliant on on individual motivation and engagement, um, which which luckily was high in, in some areas, but um, you know, unfortunately, was uh, even if the motivation is high, that doesn't mean that you have a, a necessarily the ability or the resources to, um, you know, to engage in some of the fire prevention work or the awareness raising or, or these sorts of activities. Um, but yeah, uh, you know, all things considered, uh, I was surprised and happy to see how much was already being done. Um, here you can see, uh, you can see this fire break that, I mean, these are, these are really, really steep areas. And, and it was really surprising to see these fire breaks in these really steep areas um, that this particular community. So, I mean, this was a community and 20 miles away was another community and they, they had never heard of a fire break. So, um, there's there's a huge uh, potential here just just to learn from different communities. Um, and then any you know any small help and an injection of of knowledge or resources uh, can really go a long way in this environment. Um, yeah. So coming back to the the big question is how do you manage a landscape or manage a forest in an area that's that's so degraded um, under these uh, really challenging conditions of poverty or conflict. Um, and so that uh, wasn't something that was like, oh, this is what you can do. There, there really wasn't, uh, there isn't really an answer for this. Um, it's, it's a challenge that they, that they live with every day. Um, but yeah, they're, they're also a very resilient people. Um, this is, I thought this was a, a great visual to include. So you have uh, on left here, you, you can see a young plantation that was successfully defended by a fire line. Um, and you can see all these recent burn scars, including the erosion, including the burning part inside the erosion there, um, and these previous burn scars. Um, so you can kind of see how all these different uh, solutions and, and practices uh, and objectives are kind of coming to play in a very small area. Um, and I, I found that quite, um, quite inspiring because this was uh, just, as you can see, it's just a, a snapshot, but it's all there. I mean, there's, there's pastoral burning going on, there's, there's fire prevention, there's forestry. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot that comes together in a small area. So here's uh, just a few questions. I know we're out of time now. So, um, but I just wanted to um, show some visuals because a picture is worth a thousand words. So this is one of these uh, plantations where you can see where the trees are just completely, um, the branches are removed. Here's an example like I was talking about where here's an instance where doing fire prevention work uh, could benefit the, the nearby households. Uh, because it's fuel that could be used. Um, of course, it's important uh, to leave some biomass on the ground. And that was a struggle of, you know, how much biomass can you leave? Because there were other forests that were just like literally swept clean. There was not a single pine needle on the ground because it was used. Um, so there, obviously it's important to have a balance there. Lots and lots of community meetings. Um, with children and adults and chiefs and um, just some of the the visuals of 
uh, field assignments, trainings, and um, you know presenting the the good the good side of fire and the bad side of fire and and how to how to mitigate both. Um, this this woman on the left, she was recounting how she had uh, she was trying to protect this forest, this small forest area, and and she was repeatedly um, beaten and assaulted uh, by uh, other people that would try and and cut the trees down uh, and steal them, and so there's all these little these little conflicts that go on that that um, that are really uh, difficult to to deal with. So this is this is after we got them all outfitted and trained, and we're lining out, and and we have uh, five different brigades here um, that I did a week long training with, and so this was first time going out in the field in the new uniforms, uh, which was exciting and uh, terrifying. I felt a little bad <laughs> because um, you know the children when they saw this, they were frightened, many of them. Um, and, and started crying because, and then it really occurred to me out of my ignorance, um, you know, that when you see a, a group of men marching, carrying things that could look like weapons, um, that it is probably brings, brings back trauma. Um, so this is a, um, we, we announced and, and we alerted the community that the training was going on and doing all this, but it, it's also, um, this this communication function and awareness raising is is also important to just like announce that you're there and what you're doing and and um yeah this is uh, practicing practicing tool use for the first time so uh ran around at night and, and and found some farmers that were burning their crops and say hey wait hold off wait we want to use this tomorrow can you let us burn this tomorrow so we can train and um, so that was kind of fun, just like organizing. There, there wasn't much that could really be organized ahead of time. You just had to go out um, like the night before and uh, find find a farmer, you know, whose land he would let you use to to cut line on. Uh, we we found a hospital that um, was one of the only hospitals in the region and was um, at, often threatened by fires burning on the slope below. And so to have as a training exercise for for constructing fire line, I had all the guys go out and and construct a fire line around the hospital. Um, so it was, it was good training. Um, and then you know some of the lessons learned in the training itself was it, it was very difficult. Kind of um, this notion of of working methodically and rhythmically as a team was was something that I found surprisingly challenging uh, to actually uh, put in practice. Uh, and so in that area, um, or in that instance, it was the guys would cut, you know, uh, you know, one square meter of fire line, and then they lean back on the pool. Um, and this whole the notion of progressing a fire line was, I had to hold their hand and say, okay, no, we need to keep moving. And look at, you know, if, if he's not, hasn't, he has a bunch of thick grass or roots or something like that. And it takes him longer than you go and you help him. And, and it was um, this kind of like this very individual look out for yourself uh, kind of situation and, and bridging that to work as a team and, and to be careful about, you know, the man on your left and on your right. Um, and unfortunately, you know, I wished I would have been able to work with uh, women as well uh, in these communities, but they weren't selected for the training and I didn't have any any influence over that because uh, the women were were really, really hard working. Uh, they were the ones that were uh, climbing up and down the mountains every day with, uh, you know, heavy loads on their back. And while um, the men that were around were, <laughs> were less engaged. Um, but yeah, so this is just some... Um, this is the the logo that we developed uh, for the fire brigade. Yeah, okay. That was my presentation for you guys. Okay, thank you, thank you very much, Lyndon, for uh, the this interesting presentation. I'm sure that we all learn a lot. Uh, 
about the current uh, challenges that Congo is facing in terms of uh, of uh, wildfire management and, and also at, at socio socioeconomical level as well. So we have uh, uh, several questions for you. Yeah. Uh, the first one uh, from Sterequa ask about the, the ignition of fires. Uh, she says, are these fires natural or fires human caused? Yeah, so like I said, it's, um, you know, it's a very uh, lightning prone region um, and also a volcanic uh, region. So there is certainly uh, lightning caused fires and, and you can see these at night, like ripping across the, the plains uh, at night. But, um, in these communities where I was like probably 90 plus or 99%, um, at least in the season that I was there, were all human caused. And there were, there were children for the most part that would, that would light the fires. Okay. Uh, the next question also from Esther Equa. Uh, she asked, how do the social political factors you mentioned affect fire management? Yeah, so twofold. I mean, from the resources, from this resource perspective, um, the extreme poverty, the lack of uh, capacity, like the lack of water, um, materials, uh, these sort of things are obviously hugely limiting to be able to have, you know, to like establish or maintain a fire brigade. Um, and yeah, these, that's like one aspect that's super challenging. Um, and then the other aspect that I was just kind of alluding to, it's, I guess it's a little difficult to express, um, but like this this notion, like with the hand, the cutting hand line. Um, I wasn't joking when I said I had to hold their hand and, and show them how to construct a fire line um, in some of these communities. Um, and even then it was like hours and hours. And when I thought like, oh, we can get this amount of fire line completed, um, in this you know this amount of hours it was like a tiny fraction of that um and so this what how i interpreted this was um you know the the men that i work with are i mean we're talking about a, a fatherless generation essentially of of men that have been basically just thrown into this uh, society um and need to look out for themselves and and so this um kind of like Western thinking of like, um, of like efficiency and, and um, working as this team or whatever was, um, was somehow like just not present. And this may have been like a particular uh, element that I encountered in, in this part of the country because I know that uh, from my colleagues from the US Forest Service that, that worked in other communities on the other side of the country, you know, they, they didn't encounter this. So that was something that was very, um, it was really the, the biggest challenge I had. Um, and, and it's frustrating to not be able to like really put words to it, but it was, this is something that I think it, it can be attributed to this social political drop backdrop of like the, the social conditions just really prevented um, this sort of teamwork from happening. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next question, also from Mr. Equa. Uh, how was fire control before your intervention? Um, it wasn't. Um, there, obviously, if it was um, threatening, like a, a particular asset, like they would, um, the people would, would try and, and control it. Uh, but a notion of like fire suppression overall was, was not something that was present. Um, and it was, a, it was a balance of like, okay, when, when do you let, considering how scarce the resources are, considering that if you go fight a fire, you're not gonna have like water to drink or you know, you're exerting yourself in a major way. Um, and how are you gonna recover from that? So, on the one hand, it's totally understandable that there wasn't any um, any engagement in terms of like, oh, we're going to go fight a fire. Um, but I, from what I heard, it was these situations where then the fire would just be, you know, continue to burn, and then eventually it would burn through a plantation or a farmer's field or into a village, um, and then that was when 
you know, people would try and jump in and obviously stop it, but that, that was when injuries happened. And um, yeah, so there wasn't really um, much of an organized uh, approach there. Okay, thank you. Uh, we still have uh, several questions. Um, next one from Elise Pronto. Uh, are the villagers forced to be nomadic due to the destruction of fire? Um, yeah, well, in the in the areas where I was, I mean, these were mostly fixed villages. The the villages seemed to be quite fixed, um, but the people are nomadic, and the, not necessarily because of fires, mostly because of the conflict. So, um, this area borders Rwanda and Burundi, and are as mentioned, they're still active conflict zones, and so you have a mass flow of refugees uh, from like five different countries that kind of converge across this landscape. Um, and so even people that I work with or people that I still talk to, um, you know, they've been, they've had to move their families or they're in Burundi for a time being because, you know, like my, my friend who is the, who did our, the driving for us, you know, he, I just talked to him recently and, you know, because of death threats, um, he's, he's fled with his family to, to the neighboring country. So the people are very migratory because of the conflicts, um, but the I think the actual dwellings um, are not. Okay. Uh, next one from Carolina. How is the dynamic after a wildfire? What type of post-fire restoration are you implementing? And is it always plantation or you do also assist in natural regeneration? I, I can repeat it if you want. No, I, I have it on the screen too. So, um, okay. yeah, I mean, po yeah, post-fire restoration, I, I don't think is, is even a thing um, in this context. Uh, after a forest is burned, um, like an actual plantation area is born, burned, then the people uh, often try and replant. And then... Um, is this critical period when the, especially if it's pine, um, the pine is very obviously fire uh, prone. And so, and because it's so low to the ground, you can't, you know, on an older plantation, you can trim the, the understory so that if a fire, a grass fire comes through, you know, it's still safe. Uh, but for these young plantations, so there, there were areas where it was like this really frustrating cycle where the the young plantations would continually burn down because they were vulnerable um, um, when they were younger. It's, I mean, there was restoration efforts um, that was more connected towards um, an effort to bring back native vegetation and to support uh, tree species. So one of these communities we visited, um, you know, it was like, it was a school project where it was like they engaged all the kids um, to basically raise seedlings, um, and you can see, um, where is it? I have here. So in the background here, this is a tree nursery. Um, these are these are seedlings under here. So they did have these um, kind of nurseries in different areas, and they would, you know, cultivate uh, the trees, and then they would they would replant them. And some, uh, how much of it was actually connected to restoration after a fire? Um, I don't know that, it, that there was a connection made between the two. I think it was just like trying to plant and reforce the landscape. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, we are already out of time, but since there are only two questions left, uh, I suggest to, to answer uh, them now before closing the webinar. So the first one of these two questions uh, is, um, from Ron Stephens, uh, he says, it's great, it's great to see this presentation and the work that goes into it. And as someone who, uh, who was involved early in the process, I'm curious, how and when do you see this moving forward in Congo and, and beyond? Yeah, I mean, I, one of the people that I work with there, he, he just sent me a, a call for projects um, and he wants, he already did a bunch of work on it and he wants to start a new project. Um, so I think that moving forward, um, 
there's there the, the efforts that go on on the ground by the people um, that have been inspired by this. And so for some reason, I, I had some pictures, but I guess I didn't make it in the PowerPoint, but um, there are you know, after my visit there, like a, a year or two later, like they wrote reports um, for the the person or the project donor, um, these local NGOs who we trained. And they talked about like how they were, you know, how they were able to really reduce incidents of fire and to uh, train more people. And uh, some of the pictures are great because it's it shows them, you know, holding on their own these community meetings and training people how to cut fire line and um, firefighting this this picture on the very uh, first slide here this is I think from last year um, so this is um, or the year before so this is well after the training was over and and here they are doing their thing so that's uh, really cool um, that that is moving um, of course there's always the question is okay well once once these boots and once these uniforms um, no longer become usable, um, will they procure new ones? Will they continue to maintain this this identity as a fire brigade? I don't know. Um, but certainly, you know, if we were to do another project like we we're considering, um, we would be able to go back to these communities or, or connect them to another project and, and continue the efforts. Um, yeah, I, I think that if there's more awareness and, and more interest, um, which is why, um, you know, a webinar even like this is important because it, it opens the door for more people to, um, like Esther here, you know, wanting to collaborate with Ghana. I mean, this these are these, um, like these South-South uh, cooperations, which could really um, be beneficial in, in moving um, this, this fire management issue forward. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, next one from Iwa Hermanowitz. Uh, she asked the following, did you learn anything in terms of risk communication from the project that could be applied for uh, more generally? Um, yeah, I mean, figure out, it's all about incentives. Um, and and incentive could be monetary or incentive could be like livelihood or surviving. And so, you know, what we found was like communicating risk had, you had to enter in at the level of either an incentive structure or a belief system. Um, and so working with like religious uh, leaders or working within even like uh, respected power structures within the, the, like the local, the Wamis, uh, the Kings, um, if you, if you can work through these channels um, of these individuals that hold um, that are that are seen as as the important elders of the community, um, they are the ones that can really communicate risk and, and communicate value. Um, so it's, it's not necessarily always like uh, communicating that something's bad. It's it's communicating that the environment is good and needs to be protected in order to sustain us in the future. Um, so for risk communication, that yeah, really working in these these um, incentive structures uh, of of power and belief and or monetary. Um, if you can if you can figure out how to put um, you know monetary terms to the loss of a plantation, you know if you say okay, this is going to result in this amount of dollars of loss if this plantation burns. On the other hand, this amount can be invested to prevent prevent it. Then, um, in a in a context where every little thing counts, including every tree, um, communicating risk that way, uh, I think, can be effective. Mm -hmm. Okay, and uh, the very last question from Elise Pronto. She says. Uh, what is the staple crop of the region? And how often do fires destroy the crop? And if this happens, how do they survive? Um, oh God, what was the crop? One of the main crops was, um, it was kind of like a leafy spinach plant. Um, so that, that crop I know was often grown at mid slope. Um, 
it was one of the few crops that grew outside of the, it was, it must've been a hardier crop. So, um, because what happens on this landscape is these heavy rains, they wash all the nutrients down into the canyons and the valleys. Um, and so there's very little nutrients left on the, on the hillsides. Uh, and so any sturdy, you know, any hardier crop that would grow on the hillside was, was then the crop that was most uh, prone to be impacted by fire. Um, it's kind of hard to say how often they were wiped out. Um, you know, I saw areas where they would kind of burn, um, burn kind of into these cropped areas, but I, I can't say for sure how, how much they were um, impacted. And then, I, I mean, it, once, once these uh, crops are wiped out, whether it's a, an edible crop or, a, or a, a forest plantation or something like that, um, how do they survive? I mean, this is, I don't know, they, it's obviously a huge, huge setback. Um, um, there's not really, there are no words to describe like how, <laughs> how um, devastating it must be, you know, to, to be counting on, uh, on a crop like that, uh, to be able to, you know, we're talking probably more multiple seasons of, of being able to provide food for a family. Um, so when something like that gets wiped out, um, I imagine they, you know, there's obviously starvation, um, malnutrition is rampant, um, or they, they must figure out how to work together. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, thank you for the answers, Lyndon. Uh, we already ran out of time and actually there are no more questions. So we can finish the, the webinar, but before closing, uh, just to remember that in case you want to watch it again or, or send it to, to colleagues, to colleagues, just remember that this webinar will be uh, uploaded at PCF YouTube channel by the end of tomorrow, more or less. And, and we will announce it once it is ready through, through our social media. The only thing left to say is to thank you, Lyndon, for uh, your time and presentation. And of course, thanks to all the attendees for participating. Hope you enjoyed the webinar and, and hope to see you all in the next one. Bye-bye. Thanks for joining us.